All right, so basically in the Ignite book, this is broken up, your database is broken up into two separate sections, right? So you have like developing your database and then growing your database. And I made the executive decision that we're gonna just talk data numbers yesterday, right? Like kind of the criteria for how you should build this out and how you should, you know, what metrics you should use and how you go about doing this. Right? And then for today, we're going to spend the rest of the time today um, basically talking about how you build out um, your database with the existing relationships that you have. Right? Because every, all the assumptions that we made yesterday, like 300 calls a week, 1,200 a month, you talk to everybody at every single quarter, right? This is like, that was all like, you just moved here, don't know anybody, don't know the territory. Right, and that you're gonna end up in this balance of like trying to research and learn the neighborhoods and whether or not people will do deals there and trying to add relationships, you know, into your database, trying to develop new relationships, right? So um, we're gonna cover basically like these main topics and these, these main groups of people. In the book, they have this split up into like 12 different categories, but I'm gonna lump in you know, family and friends, right? Um, and then I'm gonna refer to like any people in professional services or anything like that as like vendors, right? Which is a, a big place that you can get business from. That's where you can get relationships. And I'm gonna cover basically like these, uh, we'll say these three for now, main topics. So Josh at the last team meeting, and he probably says this at every team meeting, He's a big proponent of making sure that you have 20 conversations, right? And it's 20 dedicated conversations about real estate. So not just a, a conversation that you have with someone, a conversation about real estate, right? And you'll see how surprisingly easy it is to get to these 20 conversations, right? You might think like, Man, that's I, I only talk to one or two people a week about real estate, and like that's just going to be so difficult. But you'll see how fast this adds up, right? And then we'll take a look at what uh, each of these like separate categories can like play a role in you building out that list of that 1200. I'm still going to say is the magic number that you guys are trying to get to. We'll say zero. <laughs> 1200. 1200 total contacts. Yeah. You'll, you'll see the video. Okay. You're, you're way over this? Okay. Okay. Well, then that's, that's also some database work, and we'll cover that in the next one. Like how you put these people into different buckets. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit today. Um, but the, the whole gist of it is like, you really want to get to this and it's 1200 people that know you're in real estate. So if you've got a hundred thousand or whatever, then amazing. You're probably just not working it like you need to. So we'll talk about that too. And I covered a little bit of it yesterday. So 20 conversations with real estate people. Has anyone read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All the rest of you guys have got to read Outliers. Can you write the name? Yeah, 100%. He is probably my favorite author. Malcolm Gladwell is his name. He's got a million. Um, and I'm going to tell you, you need to read two of them, actually. Have you read Tipping Point? Yes. Okay. They're books. So I would recommend highly that you guys uh, read each of these books by Malcolm Gladwell. Not just because they're New York Times bestsellers, and I say that lightly, they're like, some of the most read books ever. Um, the reason that he's so popular, besides that he's like Canadian and a friendly person, he's extremely well-educated, is that they're written 
no offense to like the United States, probably at like a seventh or eighth grade reading level. So it's a super fast read, it's easy. And although his background is in psychology, it's basically like this unique blend of personal development meets sociology meets psychology meets super macro economic theory. And so I'll give you an ex the best example um, for uh, outliers. Um, he talks about Bill Gates in this book, right? He talks about people that have unique opportunities, right? But the distinguishing factor in his professional opinion, and it's supported by all of this data and all these different stories that he tells in the book, is that it takes 10,000 hours for you to become a professional at something, right? So that's a, it's a lot of time. If you're starting real estate as a second career or something like that, like how am I supposed to catch up on these 10,000 hours? And, he, and there's this guy that read the book and basically found out that this study was happening. He said, I'm gonna be a pro golfer. And he went out and was just kind of at the driving range. He's playing golf and he's running around doing golf with his friends. And Malcolm Gladwell said very specifically, stop. It has to be 10,000 hours of deliberate, dedicated practice. Bill Gates, right, is an outlier. He grew up in this part of Washington, a super affluent area. And he basically, like, I don't remember the specifics. You might be able to help me out. But the short story is, in some way, shape, or form, his elementary school ended up with, like, this big, massive computer. It's one of, like, maybe a handful or under 20 elementary schools with an actual computer in the, in this elementary school, right? So this is like way back in forever. And him and some of his classmates and, and friends, Larry Ellison was one of them, the founder of Oracle, right? Started programming on these computers at extremely young ages for extreme amounts of time, right? And so when he looks at people that are outliers and he basically had this hypothesis and said like, for these people that are just like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and he talks about Warren Buffett in the book too, like, doesn't he? I'm an outlier. I don't remember. But he, he basically calls out these people that are hyper successful in their industries. This is like, what do these people have in common, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates or whomever, like what do they have in common? And the one thing that tied them all together, some of them came from really wealthy families, some of them came from poor families, right? But the one thing that they all shared in common is they all had crazy amounts of hours of practice, right? To make them professionals. And so his opinion is for you to become an expert at something, you need 10,000 hours of practice, right? Which is like, a, that's a tremendous amount of practice, a lot of hours working. And I've talked about like, you know, the extra work that you need to do on top of the prospecting, the research that you need to do for you to be an expert in Beverly Hills, how much time and experience do you need to, you know, become an expert? Like the data says 10,000 hours, but I would read, read outliers. It basically talks about like how you separate yourself, how you become an outlier for a, a good reason, right? From the rest of the market, right? So that's one. The second one is tipping point. Right, the Tipping Point, I think, was his first uh, New York Times bestseller. And Tipping Point, more or less, is about um, the instinct that you have that makes you feel some way about something. And what he mentions is basically, you know, the book starts off um, talking about this uh, statue that someone found in Greece and you know, all these experts tested it and they tested the carbon footprint of it and all this stuff. And they looked at it and they said, okay, this is going to be, you know, this many years old. And uh, a lady who I think at the time was working for the Getty Museum goes to see it because it's like the hottest thing in the art world, this like statue that's all in one piece and it's supposed to be a thousand years old and no one can understand how it looks so good and in such good, good condition, it's going to be worth a billion dollars. And this lady walks up and goes, and just, I don't buy it. It just, it looks like I'm looking at it through a piece of glass. It just, it doesn't look right for that age. 
And the tipping point basically is about when you first see something like, oh no, this is not a tipping point. Shut up, John. This is blink. This is what you guys need. <laughs> tipping points about like uh, when things like hit a mark and they just blow up, like crypto or NFTs or something like that. They're, but like blink is the one you want. Blink is like in an instant, what is your evaluation of what's in front of you? Right? It's for sure blink. <laughs> I saw it a statue. You saw that statue? Yeah, it was perfect. They had an article on it in the paper. It was all over like the, to every, it was like the biggest thing yeah. because then it turned out that the statue was a fraud. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right? It was fake. But it had been tested by doctors and all these other people. And they're like, how did how did she just look at it for one second? She goes, now, nah. you know, and it's like, and it it's these two are related. It's that she had seen so many statues all over the world for so long, right? That she was an expert in that type of stuff, but she also knew in an instant, she didn't exactly know why, right? But she knew in an instant that that would work. And so, you know, like when Kristen is talking about the RPA and like, hey, this, you know, uh, the example she just gave was that, um, you know, she had she had some clients or she was representing buyers and the buyers were trying to get in to do the final walkthrough and the listing agent was not letting her in. What Kristen just mentioned is that contractually, those people have to have to let them in there, right? But they're not allowed to legally withhold funding, right? So the question that was posed to Kristen was like, well, how did you know to do that? And she said, front, front girl, flex on them, right? It's like Kristen's level of experience let her know when she was on the phone with that agent. But if she leaned on them about the walkthrough, then she'd be able to get through there, right? So read blank, read outliers, and then the term that like, people use for this. Um, I don't like using the word broker because it's kind of, it's literally a misnomer. Like if you don't have a broker's license, you are not a broker. But in the commercial world and in investment world, everyone says broker, nobody says agent, right? Because they want to associate themselves with brokers on Wall Street, money managers, like people that sell securities, which are brokers, right? But I use that word, that term broker, instead of like, negotiations, right? So like when you know that you have leverage and like what you can go for and what you can't go for, how hard to lean on your clients, how hard to lean on the other listings or selling agents, when you have details and you have the experience and you've done all your research, then you'll be more confident in knowing the right step to take, you know? If, if you have a seller with, a property for $5 million and we just know that the market is at four and a half, when is the right time for you to like really lean on them? If you've never been in that position before, it's kind of hard to understand when you're supposed to do it, when you're not, right? And the more practice you have, the more of these 10,000 hours you have, then the better your um, instincts and the more likely you are to be successful when you go to make that move when you go to make that negotiation. So Kristen knew in this scenario that they would still have to fund, but when she told the agent on the phone, hopefully, and not in an email, was like, hey, we're not gonna fund, you don't let us walk through there. And that agent, although she had a broker's license in Kristen's scenario was like, okay, fine, we'll let you in there. And they get in there, they see that the windows weren't done, now they can negotiate, now they can mess with that. So um, I think someone asked about other classes, 100% unequivocally go to all of Kristen's classes and pay attention to all of them. There's nothing more important than knowing what legal grounds you do or do not have to stand on when you're negotiating with someone, right? And so like, she'll explain the difference between going non-contingent and releasing the deposit, right? Or just going non-contingent and not closing. Well, what happens? Right, like in this real fast example, just because my buyers go non-contingent, right? People say, oh, non-contingent, the money belongs to the seller, right? Well, now it's the sellers, the deposit is the sellers. 
but it's not actually theirs. If it still has to be released in the state of California, right? And more times than not, they end up negotiating for that deposit. It's very, very unlikely that a buyer goes non-contingent, they decide to back out of the deal for one reason or another, and the seller gets 100% of the deposit without any effort, right? But you think like, oh, if we go non-contingent, and we'll lose it and we don't buy it we'll lose the deposit well yes but for you to really lose 100 percent of it you have to agree to release it to them. so like these little tiny details that you get from ten thousand worth hours worth of practice from like all the other research play a very very important part in your ability to be successful in the industry particularly if you're brand new you have to know the, these little details because they will come up in some way, shape, or form. Like 100%, you're gonna get caught with something and realize like, I don't know, you know that's a good question, client. I'm not exactly sure how to handle and manage that, right? And I'm sorry, give me your name again. Roxanne. Roxanne. And Roxanne's here today because she says she's got way, way more than 1,200 contacts, right? And she wants to know how we actually are gonna manipulate that, squeeze more business out of it. Maybe she's squeezing it like a little bit right now, you know? She needs to squeeze it a lot, right? So we're gonna spend the whole rest of the time basically talking about these separate buckets of people, right? And and how to manipulate these, these buckets and how we're gonna get to this 1,200. Because all of you guys don't wanna start with 1,200 pieces of raw data like I pulled from title yesterday. Right, like, like you see this Excel <laughs> file and you're like, that's how I become a successful agent? Yes, right? It's just gonna take you a lot longer and each one of those little records in that Excel sheet is a lot lower probability than anyone else that we're gonna talk about today on this board, okay? So I've talked about this before and overwhelmingly your first transaction is gonna come from someone in your like family, one of your friends, friends of the family, something like that, right? Like overwhelmingly, it's like 90% for new agents. Your first transaction comes from here. It's probably a buyer, it's probably for a condo, right? It's for some, something like that, right? And so this list, right? It should be included here in your 1200 contacts, okay? So how big your, family is, how big your friend network is, right? Like that all should play a role into this. And the hard part is that if you're not that confident about the homes, the neighborhood, contracts, financing, you know, like I, I would tell you guys like sitting in on the financing classes is probably like the fastest way for you to get a little bit of an edge up on your family and your friends, right? They, if you're going to ask them for business, they want to know that you know more than them. And the real fast, real easy way to do that is to get a handle on the financing. So I just got a lead this morning from someone's like a uh, residential agent called me and said, hey, there's a guy that I bought a house from in the desert for one of my clients. And he called and said, hey, I've got these great family friends and they own a furniture business and they're going to, they make all this furniture, people in Beverly Hills and Sanders, customs like they got lots of money. And right away I said, okay, cool. Let's set up a call so I can see if this is like a real opportunity or not. Right? And we get on the phone and say, yeah, we'll buy something a million and a half. They're okay, great. And tell me a little bit about the financing. Oh, we're all set. I said, okay, cool. Um, good to know you're all set. Are you going to be or paying cash then? Or what's the circumstance? They said, we're qualified up to a million and a half. Said, okay, all right. And she's pushing back pretty hard. While we're on the phone, I got a text from my referral partner saying like, hey, they're really sensitive about money. Trust me, they're good for it. I said, all right, fine. Called some friends for the, looking for the type of inventory that they wanted, set up a tour two days later, right? So two, day, two days later, we go see it. This is last week. And then this morning, they text me like, hey, sorry, that's outside of our budget. I was like, well, but you told me we're good, right? Like that's, we can't spend that. And I said, how much do you have to put down? Which they were dodging last time. It's 200 grand. 
said, well, for you to buy a property for $1.5 million, you need, you're going to need SBA financing, small business, right, which is from the government. It's most stringent, takes the most amount of time. But if you're using it for your business, you can get better leverage for SBA financing than you can get otherwise in the investment market, right? You can borrow more, right? It takes more work, more time. You know, you got to sign the life away, basically, in these documents to get that done, right? It's always full recourse, meaning you got to pay for it. But right away, I said, okay, well, the only loan you're going to get is SBA financing. And if assuming credit score and everything else, like the best you're going to do is 90%. Used to be able to do 5%, 10%. Right now, it's probably like 25% down is what they're going to need. So this morning, I found find this out and I'm texting with them and I said, okay, well, we're gonna, I'm going to put the search on pause so that I don't spend, so off the parentheses, right? So that I'm not going to waste any more time going looking at $1.5 million properties for these people, right? Like now I know their affordability for their criteria is totally outside of the zone. Like we've got to be in South LA to get a 7,500 square foot industrial building. So only place you can buy it, right? And if they need 7,500 square feet, right? Then like we're at 200 a square foot, we're already at a million and a half. So I do a quick search on comps, nothing sold for under, 300 a square foot in that territory in the last year. So there's literally not going to be another deal that works for their criteria, even if they had the finance, right? So go through the financing really quickly because that's going to give you an edge up on your social circle. They're not going to understand that. Some of your friends might understand the neighborhoods that they live in better. Than. They might know more about the agents that are there. They know about the vendors that are there they have more friends in that neighborhood they live there for longer so how are you supposed to get a little bit of an edge up on, on your sphere of influence the fastest way to do it is financing because people just think about conventional loans with 20 percent down that's what it takes they don't understand the reserve requirement they're not sure about how that works so if you're first if you're first getting started right and i answer more questions now about financing than about anything else you know, it's like, that is my go-to thing. And unfortunately I was getting hammered so hard by these people last week. I wasted some time this weekend trying to find them the right deal. You know, I got into a, a property to look at it with a, a good relationship that I have, another industrial broker. And like, now I got a call and said, hey, it actually doesn't apply for them. I know it's a good deal, right? It's, it actually made sense. But now I know if I actually do find something that fits their criteria that's over 7,500 square feet, but under $1.5 million, I'm gonna buy it. If I gotta find it off market and I know that nothing is sold for under $300 a square foot, right? that means it's worth $2 million. So why would I send that to these people that can't even qualify, right? So when this class is over, I'm gonna call my referral partner, and be like, hey dude, you, you screwed us on this deal because we took them to see this $1.5 million property that, is, that they thought was perfect, right? It was already in escrow. The escrow is getting a little weird. I was like, this, per this great, real fast lead, real fast property to close. Got a relation good relationship with that broker. So like this escrow gets weird for a second. Our buyer's gonna squeeze in there and I probably spent two hours on this and it's gonna be a great deal, good commission, perfect. But the financing is shit and I just didn't, lean hard enough on it but since this morning they're like okay we can move some money around we hear you like you know set us up with your sba lender and now we'll get moving forward because the truth is they have a lot more than 200 grand cash they're just thinking that this is what we should do but instead of last week i was in this adversarial position with them when i first got them on the phone and now they're like okay we'll listen to whatever you say just because I knew enough about the SBA financing, because they're thinking, oh, when we buy homes, we put 20% down, right? And then we can buy up to this, right? So yeah, you know, something a million and a half, maybe a million three, we've got 200 cash. We can come up with another like 100 cash here and here and there, right? And we can 5X that and buy something for 1.5, right? But you can't do that when it's an industrial deal and when it's not owner-occupied, they're not gonna be there, right? So 
get ahead on the financing really quickly because that's going to allow you to have these conversations. If people know you're in real estate, they're going to ask you what's going on with the market. How, how many times a month does someone talk to you about like, what do you think is happening? It's like every day. Yeah. yeah. It's crashing, isn't it? Yeah, is it crashing? Are, are we in a downturn? Yeah. What, what, what was your best answer for this? Because I went to like an event or like also when I see friends and family, it's like, oh, what about their interest rate? So yeah. what would be like the best to stand in the field answer about it? Um, if someone says they're not going to buy because or they're waiting because of the interest rate, uh, I always, I come back and I say, well, what about inflation? So you want to buy a $1 million property or let's say you want to buy a $2 million home, right? Historically, these homes have gone by like eight, maybe 12% per year, depending upon what, like, let's just call it 10% a year. So your $2 million home, if it weren't for just this crazy spike in inflation, next year it's going to be worth 2.2. You know, if, if you're looking in a, in a really dense neighborhood where there's a really low inventory, like let's say they want to buy in Palos Verdes or South Pasadena or something like that, or Casino or Tarzana, something like some area showing up that's like hot, right? Like I just show them the price per square foot. I mean, like this, however big home you want to be in, it's going to be more expensive next year. If it's a starter home, it's for sure going to be more expensive. Land's still going up, price per square foot in all these neighborhoods is still going up. You're looking at prices dropping. But the actual selling price and listing price per square foot, not going down. It's just not. So that's what I say. So then, and if they push back and say like, well, I'm going to wait for interest rates to cool off, right? Then you just get that down into an actual metric. Like, so what? Are you waiting for them to come back to five? Are you wanting four and a half? You know, is it like a wealth management scenario where you want to get two and a half? Like, how much lower do you think they need to be? Because if they're like most buyers and they're going to, you know, borrow a million and a half or something like that, then the difference in their, in this, this extra point, right? Like they're probably going to give that away in rent or in like opportunity cost because the property is going to appreciate faster. It just depends. So like my opinion on the market is that people should if you're looking to buy, you should get pre-qualified, right? And we should see actually what this difference in interest rate means for you. Because without knowing, it's tough. And then let your lender have that conversation with them. That's what I do, I, I would tap out. But I'd say, if someone said like, hey, uh, I wanna buy a house, but I'm waiting for interest rates to come back down, right? I would say like, okay, cool. How, how expensive is the home? What neighborhoods are you looking in? And if they tell you the flats of Beverly Hills, right? <laughs> Like, not going to get cheaper. Sorry. It's just not. It's like, I interest rate be damned. If you're going to buy five million, uh, you're going to pay $10 million for a home in the flats, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that's going to get cheaper before interest rates come back down. I just don't. So let's look at what the difference actually means for you. I'll, I'll introduce you to my lender, right? You get pre-approved. Let's go out and go shopping so you understand the community a little bit better. Let's look at these different homes take them out on a Saturday, show them everything, say, okay, cool. So the difference in interest rate is going to be $850 a month, right? But what do you think is going to happen to the market or desirability of these homes in these hot generational neighborhoods? If the interest rates come back down to 3%, you think you're going to be the only buyer? You know, that's what I would say. That's my two cents. Thank you. And so friends and family here, Financing. This is like your go-to thing for how you get an edge up and how you get comfortable enough dealing with these people. Okay. So you've got your mom, your dad, your friends, your family, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay. Today, whose parents own their home? Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. That's one conversation this week. Not about selling it, right? Not about you helping them buy their first investment property. Not about refinancing. Just ask them about it. My parents live in San Juan Capistrano, just like down in Orange County. My dad calls me probably 
every other week. See what I think is happening with the market. Should him and my mom sell? What, where, if they sell, what should they buy? And, and my answer in the, for the last year has been about the same. My dad's one of those old school people. They have no mortgage. The home's probably worth a million bucks. And he has no mortgage. He pays the property taxes twice a year. Pays his insurance once a year. And he has no debt. And I was kicking his door down the last two years, like refinance. Like, give me, I can turn this million into three million in five years. Just give, you know, give me the money. And he was like, no, no, just no debt. Don't want to deal with that. Right. But that's an easy conversation for you guys to have. Right. And it's just practice. It's, it's this 10,000 hours. Right. These two things. confidence however i wrote that right like these two things are what lead to this right and so like i talked about door knocking yesterday door knocking the byproduct of door knocking other than just prospecting and meeting people is that you're there at the property right we spoke about this it's like all of these things are not mutually ex exclusive and having more of these conversations it's like ironic that um you know, we said you start with 1800, right? And these 1800 contacts are going to have something like three numbers each, right? Then, like, okay, well, John, it's going to take me forever to call 5200 different numbers, right? We said, okay, if you kick off the year and you start Q1 and you're calling all of these 1800 unique contacts, you don't know them. They're going to have something like three numbers of your landline to some of them, some cell phones here and there, right? You got to call these 5,200 numbers. By the time we work through these data sets and we get, we iron it all the way down to 1,200 people. Do you guys remember what I said yesterday? I was like, it's that the time that it's going to take you to call these 1,200 numbers, it's not just that it's a lot faster, it's that these 1,200 numbers are going to pick up. These people are going to start to know you over time, right? So, like, the confidence that you're going to have dialing these people, your willingness to dial them, the quality of the conversations that you're going to have with them increases and improves. So when, in my scenario, when we got down to like Q3 and you're only calling people that know you now, right? And you're talking, you're calling, still making those 300 calls. If you're calling people that know you and know you're in real estate, they know and they like you and they trust you, you're not going to have time to call 300 people because the length of those conversations will be so much longer than when you're like, hey, my name is John Adams. I'm a real estate agent with Pella Homes. But like, okay, well, now I can do five, I can do a hundred of those calls, you know, in an hour and a half. But if I pick up the phone and call someone that's in my 500, right, that know me, that like me, that trust me, that whatever, then like, it's going to be tough to make 300 of those calls in a week. Because those are going to be lengthy conversations They're asking about the market. I'm checking in on the properties I've sold for them, right? I'm following up on the leads, the people that they introduced me to. So the reason I'm bringing that up is that the byproduct of having these 20 conversations and doing your 10,000 hours of research and conversations and underwriting and open houses and tours and driving the neighborhoods, and looking at developments, it all leads towards you having better and more conversations because as you're more confident it's easier for you to talk to someone about real estate and it's easier for you to put them into your sphere right so if you're sitting there and you're sitting at the bar and you're watching the game and there's two people next to you and they're talking about like should i take out of my 401k or a, the down payment on the home you know i found out that i saved up all my money but i need more reserves to, to actually close, right? To get the loan, I need more reserves. And they're saying my 401k is not liquid because I got a, all these fines and fees and stuff. If I, if I pull from my 401k to just put it in my bank account, should I, should I do that? That's like, like green light going off, like alarms, like money signs in my brain. Cause I'm like, the two of these people are having not a low level conversation about finance, right? But if I just said, Hey, I might be able to help you, right? Tell me a little bit about the, the property and, and your circumstances. Then they'll say, 
uh, no, we're all good, you know, no, right? And I say, okay, cool, well, um, where am I gonna write this? Okay. I'm gonna start this one twice. So they said, no, 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 we're good, right? That's objection number one, which is loose speak for, yeah, I yeah, I don't trust you. I don't know who you are. Like, why, why are you eavesdropping on my conversation, <laughs> right? Like, who, who are you, you know? Like, what, what are you doing, right, is objection number one. Like, your job, when you're doing these 20 conversations, is to get to. Just don't, don't quit on that first tiny objection, right? Go one step farther. So if someone says, hey, John, like, or like, I don't know if I should borrow from my, and this is a real story. I don't know if I should borrow from my 401k or not. And I was literally sitting at the bar watching the game. And it's like these two younger ladies that look like they were like finance professionals are sitting there like, this guy's hitting on us. You know, it's kind of, I think, I think that's why they gave me the like, like, oh, you have a finance question and I might be able to help you. You know, it's kind of like, eh, get like, seriously, leave me alone. Right. I said, well, I'm actually in real estate and like, I'm, I do a lot more on the investment side, right? Borrowing from your 401k in this scenario is, is probably a really good idea because you can par probably borrow up to what half, right? At like, two and a half, maybe 3%, they're gonna deduct it like through payroll deduction over a year or two. I think, I think that's a good solution for you. She went, oh, well, I actually, I don't know. I know I can borrow against it, but I haven't, I haven't really looked at that. I said, well, is it, is it Fidelity? Like who's, who's holding your, your 401k? She said, oh, you know, I, I, to be honest, I don't really know. I said, okay, cool, well, here's my card, right? Give me a give me a call right once you talk to them. I know you're already working with an agent. You're already in escrow, right? And that's already like happening. But if they haven't gone through this with you yet, shame on them. But I'm happy to help you get into your home. She was like, "Oh my gosh, thank you so much!" Like, are you single? <laughs> I said at the time I was not, and I was like, "No, I'm not." Um, but that Kristen is still a lead for me. Like she bought a, a condo on Ocean Avenue, right? She is a young, single, like she's still single. She works like an animal. She's finance professional and she's in my sphere. She's a friend now. I'm just gonna call her Kristen R. Right? And when Kristen goes to sell that condo, I think I've got a really good shot. She's not gonna use the agent that she used to buy it, right? Like, so now this is my one person. That's a tougher conversation to have than my dad calling me to see what the house is worth or what he should do. But it's just as valuable of a conversation. You guys are not going to know how important these conversations are or are not until you play it all the way out. You, you're just trying to add this person in your 1200 contacts. So I've got some alerts set up for like the deep buildings right around Kristen's property. And once a quarter, I tell her, this is what I think your property is worth. I do that for all of my clients that I sold property to. Because Salesforce and all these other companies, not even me, it's my own opinion, right? The largest sales companies in the world say you need real legitimate contact once a quarter to stay on top of mind for somebody. Okay? Once a quarter. Phone call or different methods. Right. However you're gonna however you're gonna communicate with them. Face to face, more memorable, right? So the best is face to face. The least memorable is text message. Can I have coffee with all my clients once a quarter? No, you know, but once a year I also do a client event. So it's like they all get around and talk about how I'm a shit agent or a good agent or whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> depends. But that's that conversation, those are the harder ones. When, when I say 20 conversations, you're like, 
I got to talk to 20 strangers. No, you really don't. It's just 20, 20 conversations at all. If you bang on escrow's door, it's like, hey, I know you're slammed and busy and you got all this stuff going on, but can I take five minutes of your time, like right as you're, as you're taking off, just kind of like get your two cents on the market. Maybe you could tell me a story. The, the about camera's off. You've done, right? Like anybody, you could, good luck getting Josh's time for five minutes. <laughs> right? But conversations amongst, you guys can talk to each other. This 20 should be so fast. That's three a day, right? Just make sure that you're talking to like, you shouldn't include anyone if you've spoken to them that much. 80 individuals, right? You should have a real estate conversation with, okay? That should be simple enough for you. You probably do this already. You have an 80 real estate conversations a month? A month, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay, for sure, right? Yeah. She loves the phone. I okay. hate the phone. Okay. <laughs> so, so 10,000 hours, Research all that other stuff, but it all bakes in here. It's all it's all part of your twenty conversations. Have twenty conversations, and so how would I outline that for someone that's just getting started? I say you should just have one with your family or friends, right? You need to have at least one with a vendor. This is probably my favorite place to start, okay? Because they're the most willing to speak to you. More probably even more than your family and friends. So when I say vendor, what the do I- The camera's off. Oh, the camera's off? I need to wiggle it. Just someone's gotta, oh, up. Oh. Thank you. There we go. You good? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Can you see all the way there? Yeah, they can. Okay, so why are vendors so willing to talk to you guys? Because they need our business, they need you for business. It's super, there's not an easier conversation to have than with a vendor. Vendors are probably already reaching out to you, right? Like you've already get, you put a listing on the market and it's like, bing, 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 right? This is the fastest, easiest conversation that you're gonna have, right? And you know who's not having conversations with vendors? The public, your family and friends, right? And so if your focus is to just develop your level of expertise a little bit better, such that they someday ask what you think about something, which is like the golden rule in the industry, right? If I had 1,200 people asking my opinion about the, Real estate market, like probably 10% of them are doing something this year, maybe 5%, right? Statistically. So then I'm gonna sell 60 deals from just from my network. That'd be amazing, right? Who wants to sell 120 million next year? Right. Okay. So vendors is a super fast conversation. Okay. We're just gonna go one, one of one for each. So here's one, two. Three, four, five, wait, I counted wrong. Four, five, six, seven. So we're gonna say 21, right? Because we're a little bit better than Josh Spitzen. Right? He says you need to do 20. <laughs> okay, so friends and family, how you have that conversation? Financing first. Okay, that's gonna be super easy. People want to talk about interest rates. How does interest rate even work? Someone tell me. Mm. Raised. Why are interest rates at six and a half percent? Right now, they claim it's not a good control of inflation. Who claims? The uh, government. The uh, Fed? Yeah. Okay. But how do we get to six? How do we get to six and a half or seven or whatever? Like, uh, how does this work? How does it even work? How does Chase Bank come up with the interest rate? It's the rate that they're borrowing the money. The rate that who's borrowing the money? The banks. the banks for the Fed? The banks are bought, the banks for the Fed? From the Fed. No, it's been in the reserve. There is two elements, I remember. One of the bank reserve. The bank reserve what? What are you just, what are you just, come on. <laughs> tell us, tell us. Do you see what I'm saying though? Yeah. I know y'all passed the test. 
But did the test teach you shit about how financing works? No. Plus. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. What'd you say? <laughs> prime plus. plus. Prime plus. And what is prime? Banks get the loan from the feds at that rate. Okay, at that rate. And so then what is plus? The additional that they have that they will charge in order to have their costs covered. Yes. Okay, good. That's it. What's your name? Ella. Okay, Ella, that's the best answer. Okay. So it's a it's there are more details, and it's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but that's a great way to put it. Effectively, there's a floor that the Fed regulates as like the base interest rate, right? Um, and it used to be referred to as LIBOR, right? But what happened to LIBOR, Ella? It got eliminated. And now what is it? Uh, I don't know the name now. Oh. Is that prime? It's prime? No, it's not prime. Oh. Okay, so you all need to do a little bit of research. Ella, you're right there. You've been doing this a while? She's no, no, I just got, I had a loan that had LIBOR and we got oh. cancelled. They wanted me to sign all kinds of paperwork. I uh, got it. Okay. Thanks. So this is an acronym. Someone Google this for me. Long interest and bar. I don't know. What does LIBOR stand for? Who's going to tell me? The name is so far now. London Interbank. What? Offer rate. Offer rate, right? So it used to be the globally accepted rate, right, that everyone was going to use. And then when she said plus, another word for that would be like the spread. So uh, how far above LIBOR, the floor, right, is um, each of these banks going to charge their borrower, basically, right? So like there's a construction lender that I work with that is just one plus prime. Whatever the prime interest rate is, they're 1% higher than that. As higher or low as it goes, 1%, right? So, but you guys should, LIBOR, guess what? It was all a scam. It was a fraud. They were screwing with it. It all got messed around. And now the global product that people use to determine is not LIBOR anymore. It's just like borrowing in 2007 when Moody's and Standard & Poor's said all this is AAA rated stuff. It wasn't. And it was just in their interest to call it that, right? So we don't use LIBOR anymore. Right? So, so Google it though and learn the story of it and the history of it, right? But my favorite vendor to talk to are financing guys and gals because they know what is happening. They're doing more loans, right? Than I'm doing home sales. Right, like my preferred single family lenders, this guy that probably did a hundred loans last year. I didn't sell a hundred houses in Los Angeles for $200 million, or whatever, <laughs> bless you, right? So like vendors, super easy conversation. This should be your first conversation. I'm gonna set the goal to have 21 conversations because we're one conversation better than Josh, right? Your first conversation should be with a vendor. And I'm going to suggest that you do it with the financing guy or gal, right? Because they're going to give you that little leg up to understand what's going on. People go, interest rates are at seven and a half percent or eight percent because of Biden. Like they don't <clears throat> more times than not really know what they're saying. They don't understand what that means. Like, what does Biden's fiscal policy have to do with your actual interest rate? Well, it's associated with it because of inflation, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Right? But if you understand how where interest rates come from and how banks come up with these numbers, then you'll have a better understanding. Okay? Also, when someone says, well, what would my monthly payment be? 
you know, on this house? If you don't have a, a fast, easy answer for like, well, if you put 20% down, the house is million two, you're gonna borrow a million bucks, it's gonna be out about $6,800. All in, probably $7,400. Property taxes, insurance, and everything like that in a month. Then they go, oh, wow, this person knows more than me. But really, all you did was look at interest rates or you punched into Redfin. Hey, if I bought this house, how much is the monthly payment going to be? Right? You guys should be doing that in your 10,000 hours. It's going to help you have more confidence. It's going to help you have more conversation. What are you using today to fill the labor? I, I don't even know. It's this something else. <laughs> it's a. Uh, so where are the interest rate coming from? The treasury. You should and you should reference like the ten-year treasury, which is the Fed, basically. But learn this story and talk about it, because next time someone says people in the real estate industry are a bunch of crooks and they're sitting next to you at a bar, you can say like, "Hey, it's more the banks." You know, let me tell you about the London International Bank or whatever, whatever it is. Okay, maybe it's a little weird. Right? Maybe they think you're hitting on them too. But hopefully someday you put them into this bucket and they become a client. Okay, real estate agents. Probably your second easiest conversation is coming from real estate agents. Who who's gone to an open house this week? Okay. Hopefully everybody, right? And when you walk in, you go, oh, hey, what's up? Okay, cool. Oh, third bedroom looks a little small. Then you kind of walk through there and you walk out? No, get it. You're there, right? Make this your opportunity to have a serious conversation with this person, right? Don't worry about adding a lot of value to the conversation when you're at this person's listing, you know? Say, Hey, what's the activity look like so far? How do you feel about the pricing? Right? And if they say, oh, you know, it's, we're a little, you know, we know we're a little aggressive, but kind of this is where my client wanted to take the market. Don't go, okay, cool. Say, you know, well, and what do you think? What do you think it's going to trade? And like, it does seem a little aggressively priced, right? Because I did my homework before I came over here. We're at 1200 square foot. And the guy that teaches at night is going to list his new listing at a thousand media square foot, right? So like, and it's brand new construction, and that's not what you have here. I mean, you don't, don't say that, but like, that's <laughs> that's the point. Make these make them quality conversations, right? Because this person someday, like Kristen alluded to in the class before, right? Your reputation a lot of times can allow you to win business even if you don't have all your cards to play, right? So the guy that left in the Dodgers hat asked her the question about, well, what, you know, what if I don't have my pre-approval in there? You know, like, can I just tell them we'll get it in a day or two? And Chris was like, no, but unless they're, they're real liquid, right? Maybe you just send, if I show you proof of funds for $20 million for my client, do you need to prove pre-approval on their $2 million house? No, but can I show nothing? Maybe. If you got the relationship, you have the reputation, right? There are people that, that like Kristen, and Kristen's written offers on some of my listings before, you know? And I know like, okay, well, this guy's gonna perform. This is a, this is a better offer you know, than, this, than this other offer because I know Kristen's got her shit together, right? Not just because she's like, an expert in all the documents and contracts, but because I also know Kristen well enough to know she's not working with these buyers if they're not real. You know what I mean? So like, this is, this is an important part of you building your business, right? Because that relationship might someday help you get new business. Now, the place that I came from, Marcus and Millichap, in the open reputation has a horrible reputation with sellers, right? Because a lot of people that go there get calls from all of them all day. Like it's not weird for major apartment owners to get five calls from five different Parks and Millichap agents. 
because they're all young. They don't know any better. They're just calling everybody. They're trying to get a check, right? The splits at that firm are horrible, right? So they got to close a lot of deals just to be able to feed yourself. And that's why in the agent community, coming from Marcus Milchak has a good reputation because they know you've worked like crazy. And if you could feed yourself on 25% split, right? That like, you must've done some deals. If I come in, if I meet a multifamily agent who says he's been at Marcus Milchak for 10 years, I know that guy's been through cycles, it's been up and down, right? And he must be doing very well. He's probably a vice president by now. And like he's made a, a ton of money. I don't even need to know who he is or anything like that. You spent 10 years in that office. You've been by proxy part of big deals, small deals. Like you've probably seen or heard everything just having a desk at that location. But sellers, a lot of times won't even take offers from Marcus and Melichap agents. Because if you're a young person, you don't really know what you're doing, you get a listing and, you're, and that's their first interaction with Marcus and Melichap. And Marks and Milichap teaches you how to double end deals, right? How to like manipulate the market and circumstances so that you can make more money, so they make more money. It has a reputation that you can kind of be a little bit slimy if you come out of there, right? And so if I get an offer from an m, m agent that I don't know, and they try to pull something like that guy asked Kristen, like, oh, the proof of funds are coming. I know they're probably not coming, right? And like, there's probably some weird situation there. So not all Marks and Milchap agents are bad. Some of them are very, very good agents. Some of my very good friends are, but the agents that have been around a while know like you better get your I's dotted and your T's crossed if you're gonna deal with a Marks and Milchap person, okay? But this should be an easy conversation for you guys to have. And okay? you should go to at least one open house every single week and you should be having a conversation with that person. Okay. So there's, your, there's four conversations in a month, but we're already at three. How easy is this? Friends and family, piece of cake, vendor, they want to talk to you, right? And this is also a good, a good place to learn valuable nuggets of information, pieces of information about what's happening in the market, right? Real estate agents, great way to learn case studies and stories about like, how you can win business. Oh, how long have you known the client here? I actually just door knocked it. Well, what are you going to do next week? Probably go and door knock next, to, <laughs> next door, <laughs> right? So real estate agents are really easy. Real estate services. I'm going to say this is not vendors. Let's call vendors. I'm going to distinguish the difference here. Um, vendor would be like termite. Staging. Um, I said financing earlier, but we'll put that under real estate services. And we're not going to call them financing. We're going to call them lenders. Okay, what are some of the different types of loan review time loans that we covered? So we've got like conventional, right? We put in a bucket. No, we didn't say jumbo. Conventional? Yeah. Private. <laughs> Private, right? Okay. Uh, Private or non conforming. The FHA and conventional loans. Yeah. Yeah. So non conforming, or we'll say like, and then I think down here I put like alternative loans. Right? We went into a sale lease back. We talked about that. We talked about like income loans for like investment property, right? And we got into debt service, right? Who can tell me what the debt DSCR stands for? Debt service ratio? What's the debt service ratio? Anybody? Debt service ratio? Debt service ratio. That's, that covers the income expenses. Yep. So what she said, she whispered, because she needs a little bit more of this, <laughs> right? Is that it's 
the debt, the debt service, which is a, just a fancy way of saying mortgage, right? The debt service coverage ratio is the ratio by which you have income that is larger than the payment. So if we have a property producing $15,000 a month, an income after all the expenses and everything like that, right? And we're gonna borrow 10K per month. This ratio is 1.5 to one, right? It means that We've got one and a half times coverage over the um, debt. Right? So debt coverage ratio. But if you want to learn more about this, right, and you want to like double down and know about financing, and you want to talk to someone in real estate services, you get it. You guys get going to get an email from a, some hard money person, right? Some hard money lender. You've got an email maybe in your inbox right now from a construction lender, someone that's doing um rti projects or whatever pick up the phone and talk to that person and actually see okay cool tell me how it's different than a conventional one. how does this qualify right what where have you done these projects before what's the what's the current project that you guys have lent on right like give me the details and then get all the way into the weeds for that property because someday you're gonna have a buyer that says or a potential buyer that says Oh, I'm actually looking at, I'm looking at this home. Tell me what you think about it. And you look at it and then the agent remarks, it says, oh, um, foundation issues. There's an environmental spill here. And right away you can say, hey, potential buyer, I, I actually know this product really well. You're not gonna be able to get a conventional loan. What you're gonna have to do is get a hard money loan, right? So I know you set some money aside, we need to set aside some additional capital for you to pay points, right? And then we're going to get a bridge loan until we can cure these issues. Here's what that's going to cost you, right? And if you're not prepared to do this, then I love this opportunity. I love this neighborhood. I love Silver Lake, right? I think Silver Lake is great. A lot of the stuff there is non-conforming. There's work done not to code. There are hillsides and things. It's weird. It's a good opportunity to gentrify a neighborhood. Kind of took a hit back from COVID. A lot of the product there is going to look like this, right? It looks pretty in the front, but not in the back. The bones are weird, right? So, like, we can look in Silver Lake and we can look at, I'm happy to take you to this property, but we're not going to be able to get a conforming loan. Here's how it's different than um, the conventional loan that you, that, you know, that you typed into Rocket Mortgage, right? So have that conversation. That should be super easy to talk to one of these lenders. Once a week, talk to a, a different lender, piece of cake. You'll learn about financing so fast, okay? Um, real estate agents, yeah, don't blow them off. They know more about you than financing, right? And so blink, right? Like I talked to a lender about an income property and I go, oh, what's income? Like no calculator, right? Like. Oh, oh, what cap rate? Where is it? Okay, cool. how about, uh, uh, is that one current on rent? Okay, yeah, no, probably like 575, maybe 585. What's our credit score? 700? Okay, oh yeah, oh no, yeah, we can, we, we can probably do 70% LTV. Like they do this faster and so much more frequently than we do, that if you could just learn a little bit of their spiel or a little bit of that, algorithm that they have in the back of their head, it's going to make you more confident and you're going to have better conversations, right? If I would have had another 50 conversations with lenders before I met Kristen in the bar, right? At Nick and Steph's, if you guys have ever been downtown, fabulous steakhouse, right? Um, now Kristen is one of my clients because I just knew a little bit more about financing or I cared to listen a little bit more than the agent that she was otherwise working with. Okay, so one conversation there. Oh God, also easy conversations. We're just gonna go straight to three conversations here. Okay. Yeah, 
Quick question, going back to vendors and I guess real estate services. Yeah. Up in the Bay Area, there's a lot of get togethers like real estate motion where we all like weekly kind of get together. Love that about the Bay Area. Is there anything on here like that? Of yeah. course there is. Of it's all it's over the place. Um, any that I would recommend? Um, I mean, the office has masterminds, which you should attend when you can. Um, but then like there are, you know what, to be honest, like, and if you're from the Bay Area, you should get on Discord. Do you know what Discord yeah, is? Discord. Okay, and you should look up Ryan Pineda's okay. um, a group, which is called Tykes, T-Y-K-E-S. Because it's probably like one of, or I wouldn't even say one of, it's the most progressive group of real estate people that I am associated with. I'm like a moderator in that group. Um, and I'm not on there as often as I should be. It's a lot of super young, really aggressive people. Um, and they have one group that is that they call like real estate in real life. And it's like people doing wholesaling and buying these things. And these people are partnering and they're using crypto to invest in portions of properties. It's like, it's like the future. And even like Goldman Sachs is, is getting behind it. So like you're anywhere and someone says crypto and they talk about real estate investing, they probably don't know that people are actually doing this in real life. They're using Ethereum to purchase small pieces of property like uh, in a large syndication. Yeah, that like, and so like you'll learn real quick, you'll come across a bunch of terms about things that you don't know. Um, and so like, I, I would check that out really quickly because like your Bay, the Bay vibe is like strong and you know, it's a bunch of tech people. They're like, we can do this without agents and there's lenders in there. And, um, so like, I might even count that as like 10 conversations because sometimes I get in that board and people are asking like, you know, is a, is a five a good cap rate for a duplex in Echo Park? You know, I've, I've like seen questions like that. And I said, no, it's not. And some other guy goes, yes, it is. I'm like, no, oh, this is wrong. I don't even know. Him. Like, who are you? Like, so I've like met people actually from there. So it's, that's like a really abstract thing. But there are like open, at open houses and like just in your community, you'll find people that, um, that are interested in doing this. And when you, when you open up your mind and take a little bit of a leap of faith to have these 20 conversations, what you'll find is that as long as they think you have some inkling of what you're talking about, they're all ears. You know, it's way easier to get in that door if you just have a little nugget or like I refer to them as like aces, right? Like you're playing poker and someone throws an ace out, like uh, that's very valuable. It's very important, right? Like um, being like the loudest or most like boisterous person in your real estate circle or community more times than not is not the best way it's just be like when you speak you want to have some very good detailed information a very good story and that's what's going to capture everyone's attention right but you need to know like get into the weeds on it you can't just oh you're right interest rates are up it's not very no, no one's calling me after that presentation <laughs> right they are up fuck by it yeah wow like Okay, so hobbies. What are you guys into? You like to party, you said, right? <laughs> we said we said our New York buyers come in 10 million from West Hollywood. He's like, and he likes to rip it, and you go, nobody parties harder than I do. <laughs> okay. So this is this is your easy in, right? But this is separate for a reason. You can't have these conversations with friends and family uh, about hobbies, right, or things that you do. So, like, I've got a good friend that, like, that makes a ton of money, and he sponsors a kickball team, you know, it's, like, on their shirts. Like, his kickball team in the South Bay is, like, very good. His name's Charles Fisher. He's a really, really good agent. He's probably, like, uh, I think he's, like, the second or third like highest producing agent in uh, 
at like Coldwell Banker or Sunbees, wherever he is in that office. But he's like a super young guy and he's got this crazy network. I should probably like have Charles come in and do a conversation on like sphere of influence or because this number for 1200 for him is like insane. Like, and so you pull out your Instagram and follow Charles for sure. Yeah. I think he's got the best social media presence of anyone online. And I don't know who he hires to do it. I think he's probably too busy to do it. But if your Instagram looks like Charles' Instagram, you'll win business. And his name is just Charles Fisher. Is it Charles Fisher? I'm going to tell you in a sec. Hold on. Fisher Real Estate. That's Fisher. Fisher Real Estate. Oh. I think he's got the best. I think he's got the best Instagram. Sure. Sure. It's a tall, strappy guy. Oh, Fisher Real Estate. Fisher Real Estate. So, yep, it's Fisher, F I S H E R, Real Estate. I think he's got the best mix of like, hey, this is my listing. And like, Hey, check out what's going on in the South Bay. He puts other brokers' listings on there, right? But he's developed more and more of a following. And last time I talked to him, he had a pretty good amount of like business of people coming to him from Instagram. Because if one of his friends and family is talking to someone, they go, Oh, you should use Charles, right? They go, Oh, uh, no, I'm all set. Okay, we'll just check out his Instagram. And then they look at Charles' Instagram and they stack it up next to the other agent they were going to use. And they're like, this guy looks like he's doing deals. You know, this is this guy's probably got some inventory. He's probably got the best Instagram. But he sponsors a kickball team. You know, <laughs> he doesn't even play on it. He's too, he's too busy, right? But everyone that's out there running around, like I think he like hosts a cocktail party at the start and then he like pitches in for like a little bit of the beer every week or something when they go to some bar but everyone there is like oh yeah yeah like charles charles is the best charles is the coolest right and he's just because like he like buys our beer and stuff and he buys the kickballs and he bought our gear you know and so it's like i think it's because kickball was one of his hobbies where he used to do like flag football on the beach and then maybe that's the first one he Realized that kickball had a broader network. I don't know what it is, but that was a hobby that he's legitimately turned into real marketing and prospecting business. Um, you like to party, right? So where do you go? Uh, Hollywood downtown. Downtown Hollywood. You don't care. You'll party wherever the girls are. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you're downtown, right? If you're gonna go downtown. Spend one of your 10,000 hours seeing what's going on downtown before you go party down there. Because someone's going to say, oh, I didn't know downtown had, had this kind of stuff here. And someone else is going to say, oh, I, I just come down here to party. This place is a dump. And if somehow you can move your way into having a conversation with that person, just have like a little bit of an ace that you could throw out. I love downtown as an investment long term right I think the, the issues that we're having in LA County with being able to build um, LA City, other than like outside of Santa Monica and Beverly Hills, right, is, is so development friendly that I think this big construction problem and population growth problem that we have is gonna get is gonna have to get solved by the city of LA. It's not going to get solved by Santa Monica. And it's not going to get solved by Beverly Hills. And we still have a long time until I think values go through the roof and, and we see like larger apartment complexes and stuff like that in downtown. It's kind of happening it happened in Koreatown over the last like five years. I think downtown is the only place that we're going to see like all these massive buildings and a bunch of units being added. There are a lot of them there now. There are a lot of them now. And I lived in one for a while and I love downtown, but I'm bullish on like downtown growing and becoming even like bigger than it is now. I think every block's gonna have a high rise. I think they'll put like 
height restrictions on properties, meaning they have to be taller than something. I don't know where else we're going to put a million doors. Like, I don't know where we're going to do it. It's, but I, I think it's got to be in LA City. I don't see Beverly Hills wanting a lot more people. I don't see Santa Monica wanting to do it. So I think LA, LA City is just going to flush more people into Koreatown and mid cities about that. I think it's going to blow up. That's my two cents. So if I were downtown and I was partying with someone, right? And they said, like, oh, I like these buildings. That's all you need. Look at these buildings. Someone says anything about the home. Look, I can't believe the homelessness population out there. Can you, what, what does that mean for the real estate? Do you, what do you know about affordable housing? Can you just slide a little ace there so that you can strike up a conversation with that person? Just enough to get their contact info, the right? You need to make sure you leave every conversation with their contact information. Okay? This is easy for your family and friends, but every conversation you need their contact information. Why is that so important? For your business to grow. Okay. And because, but why though? It's because you need to talk to them once a quarter. That's it. You need to talk to them once a quarter. Face to face would be best. The least preferred method of doing it is text message, right? But you need to talk to that person once a quarter. So that when that person you met at a party, someday, shape or form, saves up the money to buy their own place, you just want to seat at the table. You know? That's the whole piece. You need their contact information so that you can contact them, right? And don't leave these conversations without this. And if you have 21 convers, okay, we'll make the math more simple. Go back to Josh's number, not mine. 20 conversations a week. How long is it gonna take you to get 1200 contacts? Four weeks, 300 a week. Oh, Six weeks. 20, 20 a week is oh, 20 to 600. So, that'd be 600 weeks. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, nope. 60 weeks. 60 weeks. I need, I need <laughs> one, right? So, this, so in one year, you guys should get your 1200 contacts just by your conversations. That makes sense? You know, what if you're also door knocking, right? And you're making cold calls and you're getting to know people, right? That's why like, this is so critical for you to build your business. It only takes like 1200 people. John told us in class, he only knows 500 people that know him. I don't know what the actual number is, right? It's probably, probably, but in 60 weeks, you can have 1200 people that you've actually spoken to Face to face, not even just people that know you or anything, right? And then, what are you going to do with these twelve hundred contacts? Like that's their prospecting piece. You're still going to prospect, but now you're going to start marketing to them. Okay? So you put them in an the email drip campaign. You send them flyers, right? You hit them up on Instagram. You send them stuff from the Real Deal. You send them stuff from the LA Times. You send them stuff from the Wall Street Journal, right? And now that's like, oh my god, I. One, one day, one of these people is going to call you and say, like, hey, you know, we've been looking at, I don't know, it's been a while since I met you at that club downtown, you know, the reserve, which is, you know, maybe five years ago, but I follow you on Instagram and Facebook and you hit me up every few times a year. Like, I, I actually, I don't party like that anymore. I got a wife and two kids and we're looking for a place in Studio City. And by then, you should have a really good informed opinion on Studio City. Maybe that's not your farm and you didn't go after that, but you spent something close to 10,000 or 1,000 hours or whatever, you should, have a, you should know a little bit about it, right? So now you have an opportunity with that potential buyer. That guy's going to go buy something for 3 million bucks, 40 million bucks, who knows, five years from now what it's going to be worth. That's literally what this is, right? And so like you could, have no actual conversations with anyone you know or any vendors or whatever. But what I said on the first day, and what I've said a few times is like the good and the bad news about starting a real estate business is it's self-paced. If you want to have 40 conversations a week, 
and in 30 weeks have 1200 people's contact information that's not even that's not crazy like that's actually very doable for you to have 1200 contacts in half this time in 30 weeks how many more weeks do we have till the end of the year like 10 10 weeks something like that right so if you had 40 conversations over the next 10 weeks you have 400 people in your database whereas maybe you have zero in it right now or 10 or 100 or whatever right so this give me so we talked about partying as a scenario right i talked about charles fisher who's like crushing it and how he sponsors a kickball team what else do you guys like to do Working out. fishing oh fishing's great Where do you fish? Off the pier? Oh, no, uh, in Sonata and uh, Mexico. Oh, so you drive, you drive all the way down there? No, I have family now. Oh, you have family now. Okay, cool. So uh, fishing's probably like, I like fishing too. I'm impatient. I'm not very good at it, you know? I actually like really dislike it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because like, I'm standing like, what am I supposed to do? You said I took the spot, like, let's. You know, like, let's go here. Like, first bite my thing, you know? Let's, um, and because you're kind of separate, you're like separated from people, right? Like, maybe when you load up your stuff, you're in the bait, buying bait and whatever in the shop, I don't know. But then that's like kind of a chance for you to, but like, I would say like fishing lower on the um, hobby scale for likelihood to run into a bunch of people, right? And like be close enough to have a lot of conversations with them. And what's a better one? Working out with gym. Working out. Oh, great. The gym is great. Wear your Keller Williams t shirt in there. Someone's going to ask something, right? My, the building I lived in downtown, there's this agent. Don't even remember his name at the agency. He just wore an agency hat all the time. It's just like he's had it on his head all the time. He's probably done 20 deals in downtown just because people in that building or at Whole Foods or whatever, like, oh, are you an agent? Like, Tell me what, what do you think is happening with the market? What's happening with this? What's happening with that? And he has this little like area carved out, just like five blocks on either side of the building. And he's he's done a lot of like a pretty good amount of business. And he sells condos and the condos down there. Like he's done a couple of deals at the Ritz now. Like a few of those condos are two, two and a half, three, four million dollars. And he's done like a handful of them from just people that he's met downtown. He doesn't live downtown, a no social circle down there. His uh, fiance, I think, um, was going through like a dissertation or something at USC. So that's why they were even down there. He's like, let me just see if I can turn some business in, into this. But the gym is a great one. Anything else that anybody's into? Running clothes. Right? Running clothes. Yeah, that's fine. The dog parks. Like that. Oh, love it. Dog park is good. This is a little tougher because you don't know these people. Right, but if you're performing your hobby, you automatically have some level of, you know, something in interest with these people. You have some common ground you can talk to them, right? So maybe we'll just call this two, right? It's going to change for all you guys, but I'm going to tell you that you need to go through this. The super fast, easy one is that it would be your vendors, right? And real estate agents, these people love to talk to you. Could you pick up the phone on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and, and call an agent about their listing? Absolutely. 100%. Right? Okay. Um, professional services. Oh. Professional is the key word. We have accountants here, attorneys. And then way in here, we're going to, like, we can go all the way through this. We have probate attorneys. We have tax attorneys. Something I answered a lot of questions about, not as many questions as Shia or Dario or them, right? Um, eviction. What's going on with uh, evictions right now in the city of Los Angeles? There's a moratorium on it. 
But how does that, <coughs> how's that work? Not sure. Go ahead. Are the still active right now? Till January, um, yeah. January 30th. LA January. County, you can kick people out. That's their rule. LA City, it was every month to month. The, the council just voted to try and align it with the county and have it be at the end of the year, but there's not clear guidance on it yet. Everyone thinks it's going to be the end of the year, but there's still some stuff for them to work out because, like, it's not even at the end of the year, it's not supposed to apply to people that have financial hardship. But what do you need to do to prove financial hardship? Like some people have, some people haven't. The city, I don't think, has the resources to abstract all of this data and all this information to deal with it. This is an, an easy conversation. Someone says they're an investor, they're a real estate investor, or someone you meet, meet someone out, and uh, you know your friend's wife is an underwriter. Like, have a conversation, get some get some good talking points from the people in the professional services industry. I've got a go-to accountant. I've got to go to eviction attorney. I've got to go to uh, land use attorney. I do a lot of 1031 exchanges, right, for investors. I've got, like, the best guy for that. I don't have a probate person. I haven't dabbled in it. It's something that I should probably learn a lot more about. Pretty, some pretty good tax attorneys, uh, I would say, in my Rolodex. And these conversations are just preparing you. It's part of your 10,000 hours. It's going to build confidence for you, but these conversations with these professionals are also going to lend your credibility when you have all the conversations with the people that aren't professionals at your kickball tournament or at Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. So the way. And the people that manage this the best. Have the have the biggest and baddest businesses because like one guy you should also probably follow would be Tim Smith. I think Tim Smith, I don't think his Instagram is as useful as Charles' Instagram, but he is a monster agent. Like absolutely monster. He's a Coldwell banker, he's the number one Coldwell banker agent. He's got a huge team. He basically runs like luxury real estate in Orange County, particularly in Newport Beach. He crushes it in a point, everything like coastal. Orange County. Yeah, he's in Orange County. His name is Tim Smith. He is on like Tom Ferry's podcast. Big name in the real estate industry. I found this on the web. No, Siri. <laughs> Tim Smith crushes, right? Okay. If your social, if your social's big, so I, I am not good at this. I am a horrible self promoter. <clears throat> I literally got a lump in my throat at the same time. <laughs> I, I do not do this well, right? There's some people that do it extremely well, and it's a and it's a strength of their business, right? <clears throat> I just put up on my Instagram today, like just reposted on Josh's story. Hey, John Adams teaching ignite, and I put it up there, and I and I I got messages from people like, oh, you're te you're teaching this? Like, where is it? When when is it? Can I come to this? You know, I, I actually just got my license, someone said. Like, do you have a team? I'm like, well, not not really, but like interesting, you know. It should be easy for you guys to have these conversations. You can post something from the real deal. You guys should all follow the real deal. If you don't, you should follow the real deal. The real deal is the Instagram. And you should follow Traded LA. Traded, Traded LA. These are great, as, as, and particularly the Traded LA. These are great, great conversation starters, right? They're like, they start off as magazines or publications. Traded is going to show you like deals that close, who the buyers are, brokers. You can advertise on there when you have a listing, it costs money. 
right? But the real deal is um, kind of like Inman, you know, some people like that have been in the industry a little bit longer will recognize Inman, right? Which is like one of the original publications, but it is not cool anymore. It's kind of washed out. They just like are bashing people. Like I haven't read any of this stuff in a long time. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, it sucks. She thinks they suck too. I think it sucks. Um, the real deal though, is like trendy, it's fast, it's online, they're short stories, they're quick, they um, do a lot of conversations about big names. So you might find on the real deal, like the Altman's got sued in this thing, and then you look at their quotes and you understand what's going on, and then I find out that they bought a deal with Thomas James, and Thomas James bought the deal, and I'm like, man, how did they source that property? Because that's not really what they do. They're not looking at, you know, Josh and Matt, at least, aren't looking at like, $1.2 million development opportunities in Castle Heights. Like, how did they stumble into doing deals with these guys? You know, I thought they usually just focus on larger deals. I'm like, oh, this guy on their team sourced that deal for them. And then I looked at it a little bit closer and I found it looked like one big house like this with like a little garage here. But when I looked it up on Zemus, which is an LA city website that gives you all the details about parcels and stuff like that. The Zemus profile looked like this. So when I looked it up on Zemus, I was like, holy shit, that's why they bought it. It's actually three APNs on what looks like this one piece of real estate. I want you guys to check it out. It's on the corner. It's one plot, one parcel up, one parcel north on Canyon View, north of San Vicente. Okay, it's near Bundy. It is prime Brentwood. What's the name? Canyon View is the street. Maybe 365 Canyon View, if my memory serves me correctly. 365. Serena, will you type that into Google for me real quick and see if that's the case? It's Canyon listed view. in it's Canyon View, two words. It's listed on the MLS now as three RTI opportunities, which means Thomas James is done with all the permits. And they're trying to sell them, you know, to, to end users or, or builders that will just take it with the plans, put the home up, and then sell it. So that's kind of LA, uh, LA City. But I looked at that and I was like, damn, I wonder if they've done any of these other deals. And then I found one in Brentwood Glen, just a little bit farther north of that. And we submitted an offer. We lost it though, it was off market. But I was this close to doing that little deal. And you know where how I found out about it? The fucking real deal. Isn't that weird? You know? And I've got two friends that I helped buy a triplex in Beverly Glen. I just had lunch with them. On Saturday, it took me to, and my wife to lunch because I just got married, right? Yeah. And they were like, "What? Thank you." They're like, "What's going on over here?" I was like, "Well, there's all these like multiple parcel split up lots. People like this. Like this neighborhood's hot. They should probably never sell this triplex, which is like not really good advice for from a real estate agent perspective." But I told them this little story about how soon something's going to get torn down in your neighborhood, and they're like. This guy knows the shit. And they're actually both in real estate. One does like commercial, like sale lease back stuff across the country, another one's an office agent. So they're like, okay, well, cool. They know other real estate agents, they know other residential real estate agents for sure. But that little nugget, that little piece of information from the conversation that I literally took off of Instagram, like led into potentially another opportunity, right? Maybe like my relationship with them as a result of this conversation isn't going to lead to more direct money, but maybe sometime in the next week or two, someone at one of their firms is going to say, hey, I'm thinking about selling my house. And they'll say, you should use John. He knows Beverly Glen really well, right? He told us this home was going to get torn down before we even saw it. Maybe. I don't know, right? Statistically, though, if you, if you get to this point, People will hit you up enough, right? You can get to your 1,200 contacts, and, and and when someone says real estate, these 1,200 people, your name 
somewhere in the top three that you'll have enough business, right? What most people do when they get here though, is like the same thing that I'm guilty of doing when I get to my five or 600 and kind of like resting on my laurels a little bit. So we're gonna do this real fast. And then next Thursday, I'm gonna ask for your 21 conversations, right? And I want them in each of these buckets. How many friends or family, hobbies, professional services, these are super fast. Google, tax account in Los Angeles, and call them. Present some kind of fake scenario, see what they do. Did you learn something? Can you take down their contact information? Because then you're going to find yourself in a situation. Someone's going to say, I need an attorney. You're going to say, I got one for you, Bob Johnson. Here's his email. And then you're going to email Bob and go, Hey, Bob, expect a call from my client, Susan, right? Like she's kind of in a precarious situation. I'm not, I'm new. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I wanted to make sure that she had a good referral. I spoke to you six months ago. Please make sure she gets taken care of. Keep me in the loop or, and on the thread of your conversation if you don't mind. Now they're like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing, okay? So 21 conversations, family and friends, hobbies, pro services, people on your social, okay? This can be fine. I swear if you just repost something that you find on Instagram that looks interesting, Someone's gonna clap or say fire or whatever. Strike up a conversation with that person. Okay, real estate services, talk to a lender, right? Or an escrow officer when she's not so busy, right? Real estate agents, it should be super easy and super fast. Vendors, these people are already hitting you up, right? Here's my favorite thing. And actually I'm gonna tell you guys all to do this. One conversation needs to be with an ADU builder or developer. Who can tell me what an ADU is? Accessory. Accessory, Accessory is the answer. Okay. Accessory dwelling unit. These are becoming more and more popular, right? It's as like inflation continues to grow, right? Like this is going to become more and more commonplace. And you should understand how this works when you go look at listings with buyers and you see that something's a 4 4, but it's 2,000 square feet. You're like, how in the fuck are they fitting? four beds and four baths into this 2,000 square foot home. They're not. It's a 1,500 square foot home that is a three bed, two and a half bath. It shows this three bath on the MLS and a tiny one one for 450 square feet. And it's an ADU. We just did an ADU in our house. Like we just finished it like a week ago. From scratch? Ground, it, ground it, it up or really you it? It used to be like a garage and we turned it to ADU, but the permit took us like over a year. It was like a nightmare. Like the whole house stopped because of this is it worth it? ADU. We, we got to start using it right now. Like the first just built it, so they stay in the ADU for the first time. So we're starting to enjoy this space. But next Thursday, we'll all go to your house. house. But that's crazy. Welcome to We had a present for the house like a week ago. And he said, this is just like a hundred K additional for the house. Which is not so good, right? Because it's, it's because has like a full kitchen. It's because people look at this four, four, 2000 square feet and they go, oh, I can put it on title because it's permitted. I added this many square feet to your property, but you had better, dis yeah. you had better discount it. It's and it depends on what so neighborhood you're in. You're not going to lease it. You're not leasing it. No. No. Right? So. Could you have done an expansion or addition to your home that would have been more valuable for the money you spent on the ADU? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Not sure what the floor plan looks like. Might not have space in the backyard, might cut into something, whatever. No, it's perfect. Right? It's like, okay. You walk to the house, you have the garage, which, which makes it look like small storage. Okay. And then on the left side, you have a hallway lead all the way to the backyard, and they have like nice space, and then it's like separate door for the ADU. How and big is it? 20 by 20 for 400? Yeah, probably. Yeah, because it's all like shower, everything new, full kitchen. It's a nice one. Okay. You're welcome to come and see. Okay. Show it. Yeah. Uh, email me some pictures. Do you have an email? Yeah. Okay. Send me some pictures, baby. Oh, great video. Okay. Video. Okay. So, this super fast vendor, 21 conversations. You guys got to do it. That's the breakdown. It's really easy. Whatever you want, but it should be at least one in every category. So you should be, yeah, go ahead, take off. You should, you should be able to get a super fast six right here. 
And this should be like the easiest thing ever to get to six. Okay, friends and family, one or two or three people, piece of cake, you're already at nine. The one guy in your boat you could talk to. <laughs> okay, some lenders, professional services, and social. 21 is so doable. Okay, it actually is, but you have to get their contact information so that you can contact them. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll go do that next week. You guys, thank you for saying like you can take off. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.